Hello, DFA family. I am Chaka Pal, and you are tuned in to 21 to Watch in 2021. Um, this is where we will be highlighting um, candidates, past and present, activists, and members around the country who have been instrumental in the progressive movement. We have an amazing guest today. I'm so happy to have her here. Her name is Betsy Sweet, and I'm going to pass the mic to her. She's going to give a brief introduction because I know a lot of our members know her, but some of our new members may not. So I want her to give the opportunity to uh, introduce herself and tell us how she's connected to DFA. Hi, uh, Betsy. Hi, Taka. Thank you so much. And hi, DFA folks. It's so nice to be here with you. Um, so my, I mean, I've certainly been aware and known about DFA for a long time since the days of Howard Dean. Um, and so very excited. And then I got to know um, DFA best when you endorsed me for my run for the United States Senate. So I ran in the Democratic primary against um, to, to run against Susan Collins, Senator Susan Collins from Maine. Um, I have been an advocate in Maine for the last 40 years, working on progressive issues like uh, campaign finance reform and um, family, family medical leave. We actually wrote the first Family Medical Leave Act in the country, um, working on civil rights issues and on getting money out of politics and um, you know just all kinds of things um, on, on the progressive agenda. So, and then I decided in 2018, I decided to take the plunge um, and we had had a governor who had said he was Trump before Trump and uh, had really devastated so much of the systems in Maine and so much of the work that I had been doing um, with so many others in coalition. Um, and I decided to run for governor. So I was in a seven way primary for governor and I was the only candidate to run with our, Maine has a clean election system. We have public financing for our legislators. So I did that and then um, came within 1200 votes of winning that race and then decided to run for the US Senate. So didn't win that one, but, um, and now I'm very excited to be uh, here with you Chaka and also um, really excited because I am doing some consulting work with DFA around voting rights and democracy reform and structural democracy. And I'm really excited about that work as well. Well, we couldn't we couldn't leave you alone. I mean, you're you're just amazing. So we had to like bring you back some way somehow into to the realms of the family. So thank you so much. And I we're gonna be talking about that shortly. But I wanted to know, um, since your run for Senate uh, last year, you've done some exciting things since then. Uh, would you share briefly with our members what you've been doing since that election? Yeah. So um, I worked hard to on the to try and unseat Senator Susan Collins after I lost the primary. Um, for Sarah Gideon. And then I worked, um, so I do advocacy in the state house. And right now we're working on mental health funding. We're working on semi-open primaries. So allowing unenrolled voters to, to vote in primary elections. Um, and I also do, I'm a political commentator on our local NBC affiliate. And I also have a uh, weekly cable TV show called Main Challenge in which we are challenging Maine to be the best Maine it can be. And so we're lifting up voices that are often not heard. We are lifting up issues that are really important and we've done everything from uh, voter suppression to, um, uh, let's see what else have we done, um, qualified, ending qualified immunity to um, uh, criminal justice reform, ending the war on drugs, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. So lots of really great progressive issues. And um, so that's been great. And um, I did take a little time to recover. <laughs> so that was good. Um, and, but anyway, so yeah, so continuing just where we can to really try and I think this, I think we have a moment right now, Chaka. I think we're, we're at a pivot point and we can be, and we should be given the pandemic and what we're coming off of and Trump and we've got to grab this moment, you know, in big and bold ways. And so I've been trying to help in whatever way I can do that. That, that is so important. Um, and you've been doing tremendous work um, in Maine and I know it can get tough and I know it can get like frustrating at times. So what keeps you motivated? What motivates you to keep going and, and continue this race? Ah, uh, that's a great question. You know, I think I just have this total belief, it's like so deep in how that we are good, <laughs> like people are good and that democracy is great and it doesn't have to be the broken way that it is. And I think it's broken in so many ways but I think that that's, I really believe it's fixable and I see it, you know, I watch it. I've watched it on the campaign. I watched it when I talk with people as an advocate, you know, to see like 
if we can appeal to the values that people, shared values that we have, whether they're right or left, or whatever, the shared values of like, that people are good and democracy is important and vote, you know, voting counts and all of those things, that really helps me. And then the other thing is that I do a lot of work with young people and um, in my campaign and I just through my whole career, I've spent a lot of time with young people and I'm a mom of three pretty spectacular young adult women. And, um, you know, I just feel like we have to, you know, we've sort of created a mess and, you know, they are so hungry for climate change and, you know, accountability and civil rights and making sure, you know, just all the things that we care about and they're so ready and want to help us and they just need a little bit of encouragement and guidance and, you know, whatever. So I think for them, I just can't give up. That is so true. And I am, I am very encouraged by the new generation um, of, of emerging leaders um, yeah. because they have a hunger and a bite that has rolled from the generations before. Yeah. So it's just enhancing and, and I love just the, the, the motivation that they have and just the, the fight and the grit that they have. Like, you know, just no holds bar is beautiful. And not putting up with anything, you know, it's like, you know what, they see through the BS so quickly, you know, and it's just like, no, no, we're not doing it, you know, like, and it's like, it's, um, we had this uh, great group of young people putting forward a youth commission um, here in Maine, because, you know, we talk about how we keep young people, how, you know, and so they put this bill together, and they did all the work themselves, and then during the hearing, right, they, there were some adults who, older people who came to support them, and they got all the questions. And so one of the young women who's 18 just said, so can I just say that what just happened in this committee is exactly why we need this commission? And I was like, you go girl. Like it was like, she was like, you just did exactly what we experience all the time. Here we are, we wrote the bill, we're the people. And you're asking these old folks what they think. Like, right. you know, so I just, I love that. I love that. And I think it's what's gonna save us. It, amen. That right there, that part, and because we have to, like you said earlier, we have to keep that that hunger and grit and that fight uh, because we are at a moment and we need everybody, especially the young people just out there on the front lines too and, and, and keeping this momentum going because um, things are crazy, but you know, we, we are here to save democracy. That's, yeah. that, that's what we're here to do. Like, I am just, again, I'm just so motivated by, you know, your fight, your continued fight, your motivation and the, and the, the generations after us, like, I'm just so motivated and thank you. I just want to say thank you for continuing your fight. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for always being there. You know, absolutely. And absolutely. Um, my next question is, so if you could pass one policy, like without any negotiations or compromise, what would that policy be? Can I have two? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, Betsy. <laughs> First thing that I would do is I would uh, do public financing of elections. I get money out of politics because that is the evil root and the rotting core of every issue. So whether it's healthcare or climate change or whatever, or, you know, anything, it's because our system is so driven by uh, money and re-election and re-election money and this obscene amount of money that we spend, you know, and if we could stop that, I think then we could actually have real policy conversations and people could actually do the right thing instead of doing what, you know, I mean, we see it, I'm working on a bill, right, pharmaceutical bill right now. And, you know, the pharmaceutical lobbyist is like, there's like 5 million of them. There's not, there's a ton of them. I mean, it's just, it's, it doesn't make any sense, right? And so, and in Maine, um, and you probably know this, but maybe some of your members don't. So in Maine, in 1996, we wrote, I helped write the first public financing election of elections in the country. So in Maine, we have a thing called clean elections. And so you can choose to run with public financing, completely with public financing. You have to get $5 contributions from folks. I mean, it's an incredible system. And that's one of the reasons I ran for governor is because none of the Democratic candidates were using this incredible system that would change how we did it, you know, and, and um, so I think, uh, and I was in a seven way primary and the, the popular, oops, sorry, the popular notion was, you know, uh, she's running clean elections, never gonna get anywhere. Right. And I came within 1200 votes of winning. And so we showed that you can do it this way 
and you know, in Maine it's optional, but if I could do it that way, everyone would get the same amount of money, same amount of airtime, and that would be it. And I think that would change everything. So that's my one. The second one, which is um, related, but is healthcare. I mean, how, how can we be a country in which we cannot have healthcare for every single man, woman, and child in this country? I mean, it's just, it's, it drives everything. It drives where people work. It drives people staying in relationships and in jobs that they hate. You know, it, draw, it, it, it makes young people not be able to do job. you know. So anyway, that would be my second one. That is, you hit it right on the head. <laughs> how can we live? How does this country not have healthcare for, I, yeah. That's another. That's another topic, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's related to the money thing, right? It it's, is. It's related because the only possible explanation is people who are making money hand over fist in the system. This broken in the sick care system, not a healthcare system, right? They don't want to change it. Yep. And it's it's the middle people, you know. It's the insurance companies and it's the labs and the pharmaceutical companies, yes. right? You know, and that's and that's, uh, yeah. And, it's and so all interconnected. It's it all is. interconnected. And if we can change that, we can change this. But it's yeah, all absolutely. interconnected. It's like, kind of like a domino effect. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. Okay, my next question for you is, so you've could have, you've could have done anything else. You could have been anywhere, done anything, but you've, you've stayed here and you have focused on democracy and and reform why have you decided to stick and stay and focus on democracy reform all right so i'm going to tell you this story and it's true it sounds a little cheesy but it's true <laughs> so i'm the youngest of five kids and my dad always said to us you kids make sure you leave a place better than you found it so he meant sweep the floor and make the beds i thought he meant change the world <laughs> so i was like okay all right, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. And so um, my first job out of college many, many years ago was working for the Equal Rights Amendment and um, trying to, you know, and so I have had the incredible privilege and honor of, I then went to work for Women's International Peace Organization. And then I went to work on a nuclear treaty, uh, nuclear weapons treaty ban. And, you know, then came to work for the women's lobby. And, you know, so I, I, I have had the incredible honor of having my vocation be my avocation as well and trying to make the world a better place. And I feel like that's a real responsibility. And, and there are times when I really want to give up and, you know, <laughs> I, but, but it's, it doesn't seem possible to me because it's just, I, I just, and I said a little bit earlier, but I just, I just am so in my core believe it doesn't have to be this way. You know, we're better than this. You know, we're, we're better than this. We had a coalition a long time ago working on the budget in Maine and and people want to say you know stop the cuts or whatever and I said you know I think the name of this coalition has to be Maine can do better because we can do better we can do better and that's so and I just believe that in my from my toes and so I just want to keep helping <laughs> and if there's any way I can be a facilitator or a catalyst or a prod for us to do better and be closer to our true selves then I I it's hard to leave the fight without if we haven't gotten there and people like you are, that's what's making the country better. That's what's making democracy better because of the belief and the, the will to believe that mm -hmm. we can and we should and we will do better. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, I know that you are, we'll go back uh, to what we were talking about, about um, your connection with DFA and, mm -hmm. and the things, exciting things that DFA is, is going to be doing um with you and uh i just want to talk about you know voting rights and 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 how we can protect like what are the things or what's one thing or a couple things that that the average voter can do to protect their voting rights because that's the big thing right now like we we see all this voter suppression happening around the country and a lot of people are just so afraid that their rights are going to be taken you know, their, their American right to vote. Like, so what can the average person do to protect that? Well, I think, you know, I think really importantly um, and is to support organizations like DFA who are doing that work, you know, and I, um, and Chaka did not prompt me to say that, <laughs> you know, I think, I mean, I think that because it is big, you know, and I just read yesterday um, on the news that there's a right wing think tank that's giving, spending $45 million in swing states now 
to do voter suppression work. And they call it voter suppression work. I mean, I was like, what? <laughs> but that's what they call it. So I think, you know, being part of and then taking action. You know, when we say call your member of Congress or call your local member, you know, representative or senator, please do it. You know, those one, those we think sometimes we feel cynical and we feel like, oh, it doesn't make any difference. But it does make a difference, you know, especially starting at the local level and the state level, but even even nationally, I think so I said, so I think that makes a difference. And I think we have to be vigilant, you know, and we have to see, like the young people, we have to see through the bull, you know, and I think that, you know, when they say this is just, you know, voter protection, this is, you know, this is being watching out for voter fraud, you know, it's all built, built on a house of cards. I mean, that's, we know that doesn't happen. So I think seeing it and then being willing to have the conversations with people. This is the thing, this is my, one of my things that I think we have to do. You know, I think we've gotten so um, uh, divided, not divided so much, but so tribalized. Like, so, you know, we only, we'd like to talk to the people who believe with us. Well, yeah, that's nice. And that's a, maybe that's who you want to go have a drink with or have a cup of coffee. But, you know, we've got to reach out and have these conversations because I find, especially in democracy reform work, people feel really strongly that our democracy needs to be protected. And if they feel like, you know, that, that it's not happening, then they're interested, they're open, they're willing to have that conversation and say, really? You know, I think, I mean, we saw it in Georgia, right? When they said, you can't give water to people standing in line. I mean, everybody was like, okay, come on, you can't give up human being water if they're hot and, you know, like, so I think there are openings there that we haven't had before. So I'm, I would encourage people to talk to their neighbors and their friends and their family members, you know, around, around this stuff. But I also think it's really important to make those calls and again, do what you can do and what you're comfortable doing. You know, if you hate, if you hate writing letters to the editor, well then don't do that. You know, but if you, if you're willing to make a call and I would say with that, push yourself a little bit outside your comfort zone, right? We're all going to have to do this because I really think, and you said it earlier, Chaka, I think, I think democracy is on the line. And so I think that's, uh, those are one things that we can do to start. That's awesome. That is awesome. Betsy, I can talk to you for another hour to day. <laughs> <laughs> you have just been so insightful in your passion. Um, it exudes through the screen. So um, again, I want to just thank you for staying in the fight and, and, and lending your voice uh, to democracy and to generations um, that came before you and the generations after you. Thank you just for your voice. Um, it's so important and I'm so excited um, for the work that you are going to be doing with us uh, and uh, for our members we are going to be rolling something very special out here soon so stay on the lookout for that right <laughs> so yes very excited I have one more question but this is off the beaten path this is a fun question for you right. okay yep. okay so who if you can think back, who was your childhood crush? Your first childhood crush, famous mm. person. <laughs> oh, you know who it was? Oh my who? gosh, I'm dating myself. It was Davey of the band, The Monkees. Oh and my God, I know The Monkees. <laughs> he's a little short guy with a little bowl cut and he was so cute and he sang, oh, he was, it was they say sang, hey, hey, we're The Monkees. But I had their album, I think it was one of the first albums I ever bought. And I used to sit on the floor and listen to the album and just stare at him. So maybe <laughs> it was my crush. <laughs> I love it, Betsy. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everything you're doing and you're continuing to do. And you are amazing. Uh, well, thank you for what you're doing. And to all the members who are watching, thank you for being part of this. And we are coming at you with some really exciting opportunities. And so um, you know, be part of it. It's, I mean, there's nothing that feels better than saying, oh, okay, we did this thing. This, you know, we saved this thing. And, uh, and you know, democracy is sort of a big thing to save. So um, I'm, I'm excited to work and be part of the DFA family and continue that work. And I'm excited because um, I think we can do really good things. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Betsy. Thank you. I so appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. Stop recording.